Star Atlas is a place where dreams come true. Welcome to Star Atlas. As you know, most of the projects right now in blockchain gaming are either a, a very, very short version of a project, you know, and not a whole lot of gameplay involved or a lot of button clickers. And um, Star Atlas, I hadn't really heard about it as much from like mainstream media, except getting a little bit of, um, of recent, hey, you know, check this game out from my community. So I started to look at it and I was like, this is massive. It looks like it's gonna be huge. So just to give you a little bit of my background in gaming that kind of reminded me of it, I never played Star Citizen, but I've been following it for a long time. You probably know that. And uh, I recently played um, No Man's Sky, Elite Dangerous. I played Elite Dangerous for a long time. And most recently has been Dual Universe. And a lot of what I've been seeing in Star Atlas is something that looks completely polished, like the screenshots, like the assets look incredible. They look very, very, very high scale. Um, so how far are you out from being able to fly one of those beautiful ships, <laughs> you know, in game compared to where yeah. we are now? We're still several years out from the fully immersive world that you're seeing in our concept art. So every, all of the shots that you've seen so far, pure concept art. Right? Okay. So it's, it's essentially the visual representation of what the game will be in the future. Um, we are um, we're developing on a uh, through a very iter iterative roadmap. So we're actually de delivering first an in-browser mini game experience that will just be playable in a web browser. Um, it will have some 3D components to it. You will be able to fly around in the browser. However, um, it's not going to be the, you know, it's not the full version that we've envisioned, which is sure. being developed out in Unreal Engine 5, where it's, you know, um, uh, this fully immersive cinematic quality gameplay um, that's, you know, effectively rendered in real time. And, and if, you know, I'm sure you've been following the development of Unreal 5. Yeah, <laughs> a, li I mean. a little bit. I, I mean, I've been playing Unreal games for a long time and, I feel the limitations as a player and of um, when when people mod it and stuff like that. I have a lot of background in Arc Survival Evolved, which is playing on an older version of the Unreal Engine, and we see big hiccups with with some of that stuff, um, especially when it starts to like rendering assets. Like you can really feel the engine struggle, you yeah. know. <clears throat> Well, I, so, I mean, that, <clears throat> that's uh, the features that have, are being released uh, through Unreal Engine 5, including like um, Nanite, um, that's, the, that's the one that I remember immediately, but Nanite is capable of rendering all of these triangles, all these polygons, you know, in like the billions and billions of uh, poly range, and you effectively can't tell whatsoever. It puts very little strain on your on your video card. So we've just been doing some early testing with Unreal Engine 5 um, and be, as it was just released uh, officially like two or three weeks ago. And so um, we we're impressed already with what the technology is capable of sure. and also the ability to like auto-generate landscapes, auto-generate planets, the meta-human um, technology where you can kind of do character and avatar creation right uh, everything looks hyper realistic it's you know we're very impressed by it and we also believe that it gives us a major competitive advantage versus something like star citizen where you know they built their own game engine and it took years for them just to right. completely polish a game engine and then they're building on top of it so we think it gives us a leg up in terms of development time um but we we have a you know a big um uh say obstacle but we've big challenge in front of us in that we are building this uh, in browser game and concurrently we have teams scaling up to build out our our full game production in unreal engine so we're really building two games at once right uh, <laughs> at some point they will merge and the assets will be playable across the game environments but um it's you know it's, it's naturally a lot to take on but where we have our uh, real expertise is in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space and you know i can sure. talk about my background but i've been in it for over eight years and launched multiple companies and so we are leveraging that as a as a funding mechanism sure. uh, through our token sales and through our nft asset sales and um you know we're leveraging that to be able to build out this this big vision that we had right i like that a lot more than the typical crowdfunding deals um plus you guys going after a web browser based game that you can that players can start to 
interact with, you know, most of the time, these NFT collections, you're just holding art, you know, and getting into it from that side of things is like, well, I have a use case now, I have utility, I get to use this, and you can, it, it actually, it wets your whistle a little bit to keep you wanting to stay immersed and get some of the newer features that are out. I'm sure that you guys have a development schedule for things that'll be released and, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll help you a lot. A lot of people, they get this first deal, like, let's say I bought poster one and now I'm just waiting for game development until you got the browser game. I'm just like, okay, give me something I can do with it, you know? Yeah. So, and kind of going back to your earlier comment, you know, like where we, initially wanted to differentiate ourselves was just in the caliber and quality of the game that we would be building on blockchain. So, you know, a lot of these blockchain games are very rudimentary. They're going to be their card style games or turn-based games. Right. Uh, we wanted a, you know, real-time strategy game that we could uh, deliver and implement or integrate blockchain for the financial incentives and, and you know, underlying financial mechanics. And the advantage for the player is, yeah, you know, through items like NFTs, there's that true asset ownership. So it's not necessarily crowdfunding in the sense that um, you know, you're supporting development by contributing capital to us as a company. You're actually purchasing assets that you possess and you're able to turn around and resell later if you want right. to. So it's more of a um, uh, place to park some cash, own some assets and potentially monetize um, while we continue to develop out the game. And if at any point in the future you decide you're no longer interested in our progress and development, well, you can sell your ship, or you mm -hmm. can sell your land, or you can sell your buildings and equipment. And, you know, there's a, uh, I won't say it's not a show, but there's a high likelihood that there's price appreciation in those assets because of the way that we um, have uh, developed out the economic model and continue to develop the economic model in the game. So right. it's, I, I think this is one of the most empowering things is that true asset ownership for players and the ability to kind of get that capital back out that they put into us as a game developer at some point in the future. Right. And it, it gives you a whole lot of flexibility too, outside of just the uh, the ability to decide that you're no longer interested in that. You could, uh, unlike crypto by itself, in NFTs, especially dealing gameplay, gameplay, as a player, you can perceive changes that you think will happen within the the landscape of the, um, the cryptocurrency within the game mechanics itself. You know, let, let's say IRL, you have a perfectly normal life and all of a sudden your neighborhood starts developing the wrong kind of people in it. Now you can liquidate and move on, you know, and it's sort of like this in game. Let's say, let's say a bad faction just moved into town and right. you're no longer comfortable in your home base area. You have right. these multi-thousand dollar ship assets that you're looking at and thinking to yourself, I really don't want to lose, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe you don't like the game anymore. And that type of pressure, maybe it's evolved from something that you really just want to liquidate out of. Maybe it's a, well, we need to do something about this. And, and, and all of a sudden you get into these fights where your heart starts pumping a little bit because you know, there's some serious stuff on the line. Most gamers dream about experiences mm -hmm. like that. You know, a lot yeah. of nostalgia comes to mind with some of the older games and stuff before we got so desensitized to a bunch of this. And real world values, man, they'll do it to you, you know? Oh man, it's, you know, it's it's uh, kind of the classic cliche of uh, every generation softer than the previous generation. But, you know, back in the day, man, playing like Ultima online. That's dude, me. It was cutthroat. Right? That's me, buddy. That's me. I, uh, I, started, I started Ultima online pretty much 16, 17 years ago when yeah. back before there was, you know, a Faluka and Trammel separation and all of this stuff. And yeah. I remember going into these caves knowing they had the best loot. But man, if I saw red, I was in trouble because all I had what was I going to do play a harp with him. You know, <laughs> I was right. a musician. I was trying to farm, you know, XP and gold and stuff. So, yeah, man, I, I totally get it. So the thing about a lot of people complained, you mentioned Ultima Online, a lot of people complained about some of these insurance mechanics and stuff kind of breaking the game. How do you view the experience of uh, catastrophic loss as a player with these NFTs and stuff? Because as a as a as a person that does YouTube content and stuff, I, I always try to show off progress in games when I play them. I'd like to I like to show features, you know, and 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 show a realistic but fun way of going through a game's development and and what I see and what I like about it. Now, typically I stay away from PvP. 
because that detracts from what I'm trying to do. And a lot of my community kind of feel the same way. In a survival game or an MMO, sometimes you develop over countless thousands of hours at times and you finally get your things to where you have them that you want to explore some of the in-game gameplay. So as a, as a player with a ship that costed me money, how am I going to protect that asset without taking a risk? Is Are there going to be areas that I'll be able to say, well, I don't think I should risk that. Like the reward is not worth the risk. I just want a purely PVE experience outside of socializing and stuff like that. Is there going to be any mechanics like that? Oh, definitely. So, I mean, of the three different zones that we have within each one of the factions, there's three factions and then three security zones as we've defined them. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, neutral zone, which is safe zone when you first land into the game, discover and learn how to navigate the controls and, you know, learn how to play the game. Sure. Um, you can't be attacked by other players and, um, you know, the risks uh, from the environmental um, or the environmental risks are li limited as well. So, you know, you can go lose an engagement with in a PVE um, sure. encounter and you just respawn, right? right? So maybe you experience some damage, you have to repair your ship or um, you have some minimal loss or no loss at all. You explore out into medium risk and there will be PVP, but it's it's non, um, non-permanent death. So kind of the same thing you can, uh, the rewards will be better in medium risk, um, but uh, you'll be exposed to some risks from other players, although it'll be limited because um, the way we have the, the map, the universe laid out, you would uh, the, the opposing factions would effectively need to traverse all the way through the high risk zone and then back into the opposing factions medium risk zone. Uh. Um, so they would be traveling quite a far distance just to be able to get into that space. And then, um, and then if they were to attack you there, and you were to die, there's still no permanent death. Um, there is no recapture or salvaging of any of the items that were on your ship. So the value isn't so much there for players to travel all the way to somebody else's medium risk zone. Um, and so you can, you know, you can operate there. Uh, the idea is that if players were to uh, destroy your equipment, it just takes it offline. Now, when they gotcha. do that, there is economic impact on you. You stop generating revenue as soon as your equipment's offline. Right. Or if they destroy your ship, again, you have to pay to repair it. And so therefore there's an economic cost burden upon you for uh, for that encounter. But still, um, uh, you know, lower risk PVP, but where it's really PVP oriented is out in the high risk space. And this is where all of the best minerals are, the best resources, the highest rewards. And I would imagine there are going to be, you know, tribes of marauding pirates that are just out there. <laughs> sure. All they're doing is, you know, they're hunting people down because yeah. Um, because that is where we do have this permanent death um, and destruction uh, mechanic within the game where, um, you know, your ship gets destroyed, the other player gets to capture, like, some of your crew members, they get to capture some components, maybe in some rare instances they get to uh, capture your entire hull on your ship, wow. and then they kind of repair it, but they get your NFT, right? Right. And so, um, you know, it is entirely up to the player to determine if they want to go explore out into that deep space uh, high risk zone and if the rewards are worth it or not but um, regardless the other two zones the low risk and the medium risk can provide the player with the opportunity to just engage in pve and and uh you know follow whatever uh, gameplay path they prefer sure and essentially they're going to be funding the pirates either way right because these marauding pirates are going to be harvesting all of the resources from people that worked for them and the pve players in the low risk zones are just going to be using their 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 rewards that they've gotten from doing pve to buy those hard to find minerals without taking those risks and they just don't mind working for it albeit maybe a little bit slower you know you got it man yeah i mean um and, and one of the benefits of doing it, building everything on chain is that these nft marketplaces uh, freely facilitate that peer-to-peer -peer exchange and it's all you know completely transparent because they're all crypto transactions. So right. you can view these transactions um, on a block explorer, for example. But um, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you have a desire to say craft your own NFT, um, which you can do through the harvesting of minerals, materials, and then you know um, uh, using that to refine and ultimately create input materials. There's a blueprint. There's a schematic. And it says you need materials X, Y, and Z. And once you get those and combine them together, then you can build your own ship. And then you decide, do I want to fly that ship or do I just want to turn around and sell that ship on the NFT marketplace? Right. But 
you can imagine it's it becomes very much uh, entrepreneurial because the, the player then can determine like what is the total cost for me to construct this item and can i make a profit on it yeah <laughs> it's just a regular business right you right have your cost of goods and then you have your your revenue uh your, your msrp on it and sure. if that exceeds the cost of goods then there will probably be people in the game that do nothing but source materials through the marketplaces and look for inefficiencies where they can actually get a discount exactly and items. you know yep. they can have items and and that's advantageous to everyone the person who's spending time to build it is making money off of it and the person who doesn't want to spend that time and just wants to buy that next class of ship they can they have the opportunity to buy it from another player and then go you know do whatever it is that they want to do within the the universe that right is that sounds good man I, I like the fact that you talked about the zone uh, separation with the high risk zone because that's kind of grief proofing a lot of players are scared to that they'll just get camped over and over like streamers for instance you know because they can they could they basically can find you you know so that's that's nice that they actually have to go through higher risk just to get to you know that's comforting to know yeah i mean and, and pvp is i would say to a degree it's an opt-in because you, right. you have to make that decision to go out into that territory and if you don't then then you know you're not really exposed to it but um, <laughs> right. The option to be there and, and the high risk, the high stakes. You know that uh, I play. I played a lot of like Division Two. You mm -hmm. know, and I think that's a great example because uh, there's the dark zone. Yeah. But you have to opt into going into the dark zone. But man, there's nothing more exciting than running around exactly. in the dark. Exactly. <laughs> it is very you know, very. Crazy. Are, like whizzing by your head. You're like, oh shit. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Come for me. And I've I've been there, and those and those rewards in the dark zone were great. Like when you pulled yeah. out a really good weapon from the dark zone and you got out, you know, when you were when you were at the extraction site, you were just like ready, man. And like, I can't believe I'm gonna get out with this thing, you know? Yeah, it's really really a, good. Yeah, man, I had a I had a good plan. So yeah, like when you'd find the exotic item, if I was alone, if I was running solo and I got a good item, I'd just like beeline it straight to one of the <laughs> checkpoints you know and right. be like man i need some help to get this out of here because i know as soon as i throw that flare up yeah gonna become, gonna be yep. me down, absolutely so. they know you're trying to get out you know <laughs> going back to the web-based game how much different do you think the gameplay is going to go from there is that going to be mainly just production exploration um I, I know there's going to be facilities that you'll be able to use resources, some of the rewards available for the mining and stuff like we, we talked about. Um, what exactly is going to be the first capabilities? Like when we get a chance to play the web version of the demo, what can we expect? I call it a demo. I didn't mean to call it a demo, but whatever version you first introduced to the player base. Yeah, I mean, you know, effectively an alpha release. We are um, the, the first rollout is really more of a pre-registration I'll, I'll just you know kind of be transparent about that it's sure. your ability to select a faction form organizations um there we have a really unique method for securing your username in the game and it's actually based on um are, are you familiar with like ethereum name service or a little bit so it's kind of like dns registration for domain names except mm -hmm. these are all on-chain registrations and it's how you can secure like a name dot ETH, right? Well, right. well, we're building on Solana. Solana has the same functionality and it, you'll be able to uh, register your name. Now, there's actually a cost to registering a name um, and it will scale with how desirable that name is. Um, but the, the benefit is that if at some point in the future you want to turn around and sell that, that is also an asset that you own. Right? It's just like owning a domain name out there, mm -hmm. uh, but it's now your personal name and you can sell that to someone else. So right. everything that you spend money on within Star Atlas becomes an asset that you can turn around and resell later, which I think is, um, I, I, I think it's a, a, a major transformation from how like where people spend money in games now, it's essentially an expense. Right. right. Whereas what we're, I, I hate to use the term investment, but whenever you're spending within Star Atlas, it's actually an investment in assets that you possess. So right. very different way of thinking. And this is something that we're going to have to probably explain to players because, you know, when have you ever gotten into a game and, and been like, oh, I want to register a name. I have to pay for it now. And I'm right. $10,000 for this name, which is, it sounds absurd, but um, there's another popular uh, kind of naming protocol out there that's called Yet. 
and it, I don't know if you've seen mm -hmm. this, but Yad is, um, it's all emojis and it's anywhere from one to three emojis. That's it. These like random, randomized mm -hmm. and people that are buying Yats with a single emoji are spending like a million dollars to reserve. Oh them, my right? gosh. Right. Um, um, so ours is kind of similar, but anyway, it's, it's this name registration, clan formation, uh, faction selection, and it's a, it's an entry point into the world. And then, um, the, the gamification part of it is that we have leaderboards. So we'll, you'll be able to determine like, where does your clan rank relative to every other clan in the universe? Or where does this faction rank relative to, to the other two factions? Um, but the first gameplay is, uh, we'll be deploying ship missions. And okay. so you're, you're actually going to be able to navigate space, um, in browser and, um, complete quests or complete missions that include things like, you know, go explore this territory or, uh, we have, a we, there was a, uh, a, a, you know, a beacon, um, a rescue beacon that was discovered out in this space, go figure out what that is and maybe save a person or, uh, salvage some materials or something like a, a crate that was lost in space, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and in completing those missions, you'll get, you'll get assets such as either NFTs, which could be like a new crew member NFT. Mm -hmm. It could be a module for your ship. Um, or it could just be straight financial reward for completing it, which is distributed out through our in-game currency Atlas. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the benefit again of building with two crypto native assets, including Atlas and Polis is that the, this, they function just like every other cryptocurrency, which means they're tradable on public exchanges, either decentralized or centralized exchanges. Right. So you can take your Atlas earnings, convert that to Bitcoin or just convert it to USDC or ultimately convert it to you know, dollars if you mm -hmm. want. And so that is the compensation. That's the play to earn model that we're, that we're delivering. So, um, and then beyond that, it'll be land ownership with mining, uh, equipment and drills, um, and then space station configuration, as well as, um, uh, one part I, I overlooked is a ship configuration tool, which accompanies the ship missions. And this is where you'll essentially you know, create your loadout, your character loadout, mm -hmm. and you can retrofit it with different modules, different components, different crew members, and that results in a variety of ship scores and specializations. So you okay. can determine, you know, what kind of profession uh, you want to engage in, whether it's data gathering, data running, or uh, you know, cargo hauling, mining right. specifically, or you know, attack, or you could you could also be a security vehicle where all you do is you kind of fly around with another ship and you your job is to protect them and they've you know you've got a contract with them and they're actually paying you to protect them out in space. Right, right. So um, these are you know these are all features that will be available in the mini game. Uh, okay. And our first version of the Unreal Engine 5 game will be sometime in probably Q3 of 2022. Okay. But, uh, and again, limited functionality, but we've got some cool modules that we're going to be releasing. And what's really important is that we are actually, uh, as I said, we're developing on this iterative roadmap as opposed to a grand, uh, fully polished final product. Right. So like, you know, cyberpunk, it, everybody couldn't wait. So it kept getting delayed and delayed <laughs> and delayed and it's seven years in and everybody's like, we just want to play. Yeah. And, and they get strong armed into releasing a game that maybe wasn't fully ready yet. Right. So what we're doing is kind of releasing these limited feature set uh, modules where there is some playability. Yeah. It's not the full exploration of the world yet, sure. but, but you can do, you know, um, I, I hesitate to share this, but you can do things like, um, like pod racing. Right? Okay. With, with some of the ships. Right. And what's really cool is through these race courses, we can actually enable, or a third party developer can enable betting on it. Right. So you can okay. just go to the race co course <laughs> and you can bet on your favorite racer. <laughs> right. You know? And there are real financial consequences to that too. And what's sure. again, really nice about the decentralized world is we don't have to build everything. Right. Like we're going to empower other people to build features and monetize features that we can integrate into the game and that leverages our assets. Sure. Which I think is like that in addition to our own um, uh, kind of project roadmap of the, the tech that we're building with is going to enable us to accelerate development quite rapidly because we're not trying to capture everything and put up the walled garden. You know, we're right. essentially saying, look, you know, if you build the feature and people want to play it and it uses our assets, well, you get to make the money off of that. Yeah. Right? 
That's really, really good. The yeah. modding communities from uh, the games that I've played, like Ark Survival Evolved, like Minecraft, or a lot of times you think like, why aren't these guys on the development teams? You know, they yeah. produce some quality works that or that are really redefining the gaming experience and giving it an unbelievable extension in life. I I would have played uh, the the games that I've played so far that I've used mods for. I've been able to revisit them two, three, four, five, six times for, you know, 50 plus episode gameplays. Uh, yeah. But without those mods, it would have just been playing the same exact thing. Like, how many times can you tame a dinosaur in a game? You know, for Ark Survival Evolve. I've tamed this stupid dinosaur so many different times. All I do is break rocks with him every time. Why do I want to break more rocks? It's because yeah. you can build new stuff with it, you know? Yeah. So it adds a level of familiarity with that that sense of well, what, what else is here, you know? And I, I like that a lot, man. It's a really yeah. exciting mod. Yeah, I yeah, I, I think it's, um, again, I think it's really transformative in the way that I think games will be developed out in the future because you're recruiting the uh, collective effort of the world for anybody who sees, you know, our concept as an opportunity to now build around it. We're not trying to restrict that behavior, we're trying to encourage that behavior. And it's just different from how most game development studios think and operate because they're trying to protect the bottom line. But um, for us, it's more about developing out this robust, sustainable economy within the within the metaverse. And how do we do that? Well, through people building and creating value that allows for the accumulation of more users into the metaverse. Yeah. Because that just creates greater GDP overall, that, you know, the, 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 the um, the amount of value that's exchanged throughout the entire metaverse increases as more people are, in, are involved. And that means we're perfectly comfortable with, with sharing in some of that upside potential if somebody else externally is creating the experience. Right. You know, as long as it kind of integrates with, uh, with our assets, that adds value to the assets. Sure. Here. And that's, that's the dream, man. The, the ecosystems of all economies kind of work like that. Like you got the biggest distributors on earth like that doing things that they, they involve people like drop shipping with Amazon, for instance, you know, why have to provide everything ourselves? Why not let people get involved and and show their creativity and their marketing expertise, too? You know, there's a lot of things that you can do, you know, from a community like mine, for instance, there's a lot of people that may not necessarily be interested in the some of the game's functional core mechanics but what if i have a pod racing mini game and a, a part of my community is big in the pod racing right. all in a sudden like i have a vehicle for for business that i can start utilizing to not only entertain and foster an environment that my community will love but also something that i could create profit from you know totally. that's that's very cool yeah so i mean there's like pod racing and then there's there's battle arenas Right, where you can actually, you know, so that's a battle arenas are a unique twist on PvP where the consequences could be lower and that could be the complete opt in uh, where you're not going out into deep space where it's like permanent, permanent death, mm -hmm. uh, permanent loss of assets, but you, you get to engage in kind of team based uh, PvP in these battle arenas that take place somewhere out in space. Um, and once again, I, what I think is really compelling about these is the ability for like external developers to integrate through API to integrate things like um, like betting, betting mechanisms, gambling right. mechanisms all around it. And while we can't do it necessarily as an entity, that that doesn't prevent someone from a you know an <laughs> anonymous developer to create the feature and that uh, and enable right. it. And you know we get kind of the exit uh, plan or, or kind of the um, I don't know uh, what word I want to use, but it's it we get the excuse of saying, hey, it's we didn't develop it. Yeah, and you're detached from it. Unchanged. We can't prevent it, right? Like right? It's not within our power to prevent it because this is all decentralized. And that's, Correct. That's part, of the, that's part of the purpose. Right. Yeah, that is a good draw for it. So what's the easiest way for consumers or game gamers to get involved in the project? Pick up a poster and move forward? Well, I, you know, I th it's it's very important for us to, at this point, the uh, we're, we're quite far along in the Rebirth campaign. And right. so if you've been following it from the beginning, you know, it started at $64. But the the final poster number thirteen is priced at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars somewhere oh two hundred fifty thousand dollars right? right and that was, this was done intentionally because we do target the crypto speculator community as well sure. for the purpose of the of this digital art and when 
when you're um, you know focused on digital art exclusively, the rarity of the item is what helps drive the underlying value of it, right? right? And so we wanted to ensure that any gamer really would have the opportunity to get involved in the game and, and own some of this digital art, this kind of historic moment as we define it, um, uh, and, and price it such that everybody could get access, uh, that it would be accessible to everyone. And so, um, you know, the first couple of posters, sure, people could still buy them on secondary markets, but we, we stopped selling them at the end of the sale window. Right. Um, and so now you're probably paying a premium to get into any of those posters uh, versus when we originally sold them. Um, almost all of them have gone up in value already. Um, uh, so I think it's unlikely that someone's going to step in and buy a thirty-two thousand dollar poster sure. <laughs> as a gamer, especially because that one poster doesn't deliver any any value. We'd have to kind of look over the economic model, but in order to get all of the benefits of a very of a you know any one of the tiers, you have to own every poster from one through the completion of that tier. Right. So like the, you know the first poster though provided tier zero benefits, which included um, ship assets, land assets, space station assets, as well as like skins, emotes, and uh, pets, right? That are all unique and, and exclusive to this rebirth event. Um, the, but, but, you know, to be honest, the next opportunity to purchase is coming up relatively soon. Uh, we'll be selling some in-game assets as we launch the mini game. So sometime in August, okay. uh, we'll have the option to uh, you'll have the option to do the the clan registration and faction uh, selection uh, as well as your name uh, securing if you have the desire to purchase a name and then uh, and, and purchase some game assets from us at that time and then gotcha. in the following month they'll, those will actually be deployable and usable as ship assets within the you know the ship mission module very cool now the armstrong uh, poster i i was under the impression that that was a standalone type deal that did not require any of the previous poster assets from the all the way from reward zero on down is that correct that is correct that is correct it, it is accompanied by its own um set of rewards so you can purchase that poster exclusively from us we we are running that campaign through july 20th right um the uh the rebirth campaign technically ends July 17th with a you know final kind of snapshot distribution date that's starting around July 24th. Uh, some of that's still to be uh, formalized and finalized, but uh, so yeah, you can purchase the the, the Armstrong poster and get in-game assets from that as well. And I think with <clears throat> you know again look, looking back at the economic model, what we tried to do was deliver a higher value of game assets proportional to the cost of the poster for those earlier posters. Sure. And this is kind of an egalitarian approach where we know that people are willing, where fewer people, but some people would be willing to spend more money on the posters later. But those speculators are really purchasing the poster assets because they believe in the appreciation potential sure. of that asset as digital art and as it's going to be far rarer than any of the early posters, right? right? So like we, you know, there were 10,500 of the first poster sold and there was one of poster 10 sold. And right. so now if through 10, 10 through 13, if there's only one poster sold, then, you know, there, there's only one of those that will <laughs> right. ever in the world. Right. Okay. Um, and I should caveat that because we actually had, we did have some pre-sales or private sales of these poster sure. sets, but let's just say, for example, the maximum supply of, of 10 through 13 or 14 will be six posters total. Sure. Uh, so if at some point in the future, you know, we get millions and millions of users, the demand for that kind of historic poster that we created as the initial event um, and campaign of Star Atlas be pretty the demand could be there. And that's what these people were speculating on. Right. So, Again, we wanted to make sure that anybody that was buying early had a proportional share, a relatively proportional share of the total value spent in game assets, um, whereas the later posters are more focused on the art itself and the and less about the game asset distribution. Gotcha. Cool, man. I'm excited. I think I'm gonna actually pick up one of the uh, the Armstrong posters for the viewers here on video and kind of show them awesome. how that looks because it. I saw some of the augmented reality type things that they had for a few of the earlier posters and it was neat. It was really, really neat. I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I've, pl I've been playing space games for a long time and yeah. I think it has a lot of potential to do some pretty crazy things. Man. Yeah, I, I love it, man. I think it, it is, um, you know, the Armstrong thing is, uh, 
it, it still kind of boggles my mind that we were able to accomplish that given how young we are as a company mm -hmm. you know to to facilitate a relationship with the armstrong estate the launch of a of a um spacex rocket right which is where the armstrong satellite was actually housed and then deployed um and, you know in conjunction with space force like we're we're trying to tie the real world to the digital world in a way that has never been done before and it's it's just amazing that we were able to facilitate this relationship and they wanted to work with a space themed video game right on the launch of, of a real world you know real satellite into space and we've even tied that into the canon of the game and the lore of the game through um well just through the structuring of the of the lore um as as we promoted it and marketed it but um i don't know we'll be doing more things like that in the future we've got the whole legends uh, campaign that will be ongoing a um, couple of big names that will be coming out from that but you know make no mistake we are still fully focused on building the game but sure. you know things like this come across our plate you'd be surprised now how many times we've gotten proposed from people to to um to create nfts for them and launch right. campaigns like this and we're actually just we're kind of like pushing everyone away right now because mm -hmm. we've got too much else on our plate but, right uh, yeah. Well, man, thanks for all the information. It was great talking to you. I'm really excited yeah. to see the project and uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to its development. I think what Star Atlas is doing is reawakening our intergalactic curiosity, reawakening our intergalactic urges. There's a great line by Marina Benjamin when she said, when we dream of space, we dream of transcendence. We dream of what we might become. It is ourselves that we look into when we look out into space. And this is where the metaverse is so interesting. For I think what Star Atlas is rendering finally is a cosmos in which we can explore. A cosmos in, we, in which we have agency. We are not just passengers along for the ride but we get to be pilots and steer this mythic intergalactic quest universe and to that end the fusion of those two things could potentially could potentially be unleashed by star atlas that is our latest attempt our our, our latest iteration the latest way station on our trajectory towards the omega point and when we dream of space we dream of transcendence and we dream of what we might become. Let it be so, Star Atlas. Let it be so.